welcome to another Besides the Norm podcast. Uh, I don't know why I'm looking over here, it's a bit weird. Um, the camera is over here, so I'll make sure to look at that from now on. Perfect. Um, so we are recording right now, we are sitting right now with uh, DC Glenn. I put up a post about this. He's from a group called Tag Team. Uh, you'll remember the track, uh, Boom There It Is, which has become a big thing in the mobile DJ game as well for me, which is one of the reasons I want to talk to you. So let's get into it. Yeah, could you give a quick introduction to yourself, DC? Hey right, man, good to be with you guys here on this fine day. Awesome. Uh, my name is DC Glenn, aka DC, the Brain Supreme of Tag Team. Mm-hmm. Um, I am a man of many hats. Um, you know, like you said, I'm, I've been a DJ for 30 years. Yeah. And that is what I am first and foremost, always and forever, right? And um, I was born in uh, Chicago, Illinois, and we moved to Denver, Colorado when I was four. And I had a wonderful childhood. Got to play, got to have fun, ride bikes, do everything I wanted to do. And um, as I grew up, me and Steve uh, met in high school. And um, Steve had a band that played in the quad every now and then. I wanted to be in that band. And I also wanted to be in the choir. And I also saw my first, this is this is amazing. This is when I first wanted to be a DJ. Mm-hmm. It was our first high school uh, dance. And some of Steve's friends were the DJs. And that was the first time I ever seen like two turntables and a microphone and a mixer. Yeah. And I was like, I gotta do that. <laughs> and this is like 82, right? This yeah. is long, this is the beginning of hip hop. And I just bought two rickety turntables. I think it was a Sherwood and a Techniques. And then uh, bought a Radio Shack mixer. And I never looked back. And all the neighborhood kids used to laugh at me because I wanted to be a DJ. And I just stayed in the basement and just tore up my dad's records, right? Because that's the only vinyl I had I, I could get to, right? And as I got older and graduated high school, you know, I got finally got Steve and his band and um, the band kind of disbanded as we got older and me and Steve stayed together as tag team. And while I'm in college, you know, I'm DJing. And I remember my first DJ gig was a fraternity party for Omega Sci-Fi. And I just thought I was the bomb and the speakers blew. Um, I was picking a turntable up off the wrong needle, you know, the needle off the wrong turntable. It was just yeah. horrible. They were about to beat me up, man. <laughs> but I got out of that and I just, you know, most people would have quit, but I just tripled down and just got better as a DJ. And next, you know, within a year, I'm DJing every party, you know, at the college. Mm-hmm. And then I'm DJing in the clubs and then I'm DJing wherever I can DJ. And then um, I started writing lyrics and started making songs because my boy Johnny Z uh, who produced uh, Back to the Hotel uh, by In Too Deep, he had bought a four track uh, tape recorder, Tascam four track, and he didn't know how to use it. And I was like, I'll figure it out. And then once I figured it out, I had another friend who had an 808 uh, drum machine and he let me make some beats over his house. And then I put them on the four track and then I started making songs. Mm-hmm. And then that's where DJing came in because then I could scratch, I could take stuff off of other records, I could take stuff off of cartoon records, kitty records. Next thing you know, I've got 10 songs. And I send them to Steve and Steve thinks I'm in devil worship because he's never heard anything like this before, <laughs> but I'm making music off of my creativity, right? I'm writing the lyrics, I'm doing everything. And he was like, I gotta do this. And then he started doing it. And then we're going back and forth making songs because every time we wanted to do music, we'd have to go to the studio. So as time went on, Steve went, moved down to Atlanta to go to the Art Institute. And I came down to visit him and I had such a good time that I knew that's what I wanted to do, move to Atlanta after college. And after college, I moved to Atlanta and I had a job with CNN, but I went to this club called Magic City and the DJ was either drunk or having a bad night, whatever. And I ended up getting a job as DJ that, you know, of a strip club, an adult entertainment club. Yeah. And then the yeah. owner of that club had a, a nightclub that he was about to put together. And I was a DJ of that club too. And now I'm, you know, fresh in Atlanta, you know, DJ in two clubs. The whole city knows who I am because I'm a good DJ. My fundamentals are solid. And 
I have never looked back. And DJing has, you know, infiltrated my life in a way that it taught me, it taught me hustle, right? It taught me how to hustle. It taught me how to keep a job. It taught me how to win over owners. It taught me how all these things that I use to this day, right? And I didn't, you know, I retired in 2015. I just didn't want to be a 50-year-old DJ. Plus, you know, and I love DJing, but the clubs changed, right? You know, and things change and you grow out of them. And I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't beat off the young cats no more who wanted, who, you know, they, everybody... I would always get the most lucrative jobs and then I just had to fight off everybody trying to, you know, do whatever they could do to get my job. But that did, did you did you fight through like people trying to like undercut you as like as far as payments go? Like I'll do oh, it yeah, for yeah, cheaper yeah, and but, stuff. But see, here's how you combat that, mm -hmm. right? So in my existence, I run my life like a corporation, right? Because I was into self help, all this self help stuff. So that's what kind of taught me that. And what you have to do is you have to be, you know, for me, I'm more than just a DJ. I am your sound tech. Yeah. I am your light tech. I'm going to change the lights. I'm going to make sure your lighting system straight. I am going to make your flyers. I am going to do your radio spots. I'm going to do your voiceover. I'm going to do your television ads. I'm going to do your marketing. I'm going to do your websites. I'm going to do your SEO. I'm going to do your, be your fashion photographer for the girls. I'm going to do your retouching. I am going to make myself invaluable. Yeah. So if anybody wants to undercut me, you're going to lose a lot by paying less, yeah. right? Because yeah. I'm not just a DJ. And that's why I've always kept a job and nobody's been able to knock me off the block because I do more than just a DJ. And that, you can apply that to anything in your life. If you're in a dead-end job and you just don't like your job, don't look at it that way. Look at it as what can I do extra yeah. to, be, to make myself invaluable and get more money? Definitely. So you do extra things. So if they do start laying people off, you're not going to be the one that gets gone because you're too invaluable. They need you. And then they're going to pay you. And if you take that attitude about it, you can, you, you can actually prepare yourself by training for things in that job that are going to serve you later on. Yeah. Right. So for me, DJing, was just great because I ordered records from all over the country. So I knew what was happening in hip hop 24 seven. And when we moved to Atlanta, I kind of figured that we had to come up with a different form. We had to make what, you know, when you're in Rome, act like the Romans down South is bass music, you know, New York, LA was all hip hop and it was hard to get into those circles. So we had to make a bass record. And I went to Steve and said, we got to do that. We're not going to never get out of the Southeast. And he was like, I can't make that stuff. You know, I like it, but I can't make it. And I was like, yeah, you can think about it. The essence of all of it is Planet Rock mm -hmm. and Egyptian Lover. You take the two biggest up-tempo records from both coasts and you just do that, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, I'll write the lyrics and I had tons of songs that I could have, you know, tried to match to it. But there was a song I was working on about just, you know, partying on, you know, two guys partying, trying to get women on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. And the title was Woomp There It Is, because Woomp There It Is was the hottest saying then. It was like a party saying in the clubs, you know, throw so, your hands in the air, wave them like you just don't care. So you already like, had some of this ready just like before you even go into the studio? Oh, yeah, I had, I had, a, I had man, I had a hundred songs ready because I used to love to write, right? Mm -hmm. So I just write lyrics, you know, I get in dictionaries and rhyming books and just have tons of lyrics, right? And it worked. And um, I wrote Woomp, There It Is. Steve wrote his verses. He put the beat together. We used Kano. And you can appreciate this. We went to the studio, recorded it. It was in August of 92. And that night I had to work. And I went and dropped that cassette in. Mm -hmm. And to this day, it is the biggest response on any record I have ever seen, ever had, ever. Like 15 people ran to the DJ booth like, what the hell is that? <laughs> like, how, how quickly did that happen? Like, once you put that tape in, how quickly did it start to show that this was going to be a big record for you? As soon as I said party people, yeah. the beat came in. People were standing by the DJ booth and they looked at me like, what the hell, that shit, what, that's banging. <laughs> and, you know, but, but for me, mm -hmm. as a young man, my hubris was out of control, right? 
I think I'm the bomb. Anything I make is going to be a hit record. So mm-hmm. I'm not really seeing it, right? I see it, but I don't see it. And I'm, you know, we I shelved it and started playing other records that we were making because everybody liked our records. Yeah. But that's in our own little world in that club. And you know, one of the girls was like, "Hey, how come you don't play Whoop There Is No More?" This is like January, four months later. And I was like, "I'll play it." The same thing happened, but this time, um, you know, down when you're when you're in a region, you have record company reps, right? Mm-hmm. All the major labels that give you vinyl and. You know, they service you, they service the pools, they service the radio stations. And one of my record reps, uh, his name was Alan Cole, and he worked for Columbia Records. And he um, he was like, what is that? And I was like, that's my new record, man. He was like, give me that. I'm sending that to New York. Sent it to New York. I get a call from Columbia Records. And I said, this could work for every label. Gave all the record reps there the, the song. They sent it up. Now I got all these labels calling me. Mm but they don't know what to do with the record, right? And I almost gave up. This beautiful lady named Lisa McCall gave me a, uh, told me you need to call Al Bell because Al Bell had a, a record called Daisy Dukes. That was a bass record that he put out the year before. Right. And if you don't, people don't know who Al Bell is, in the beginning of soul music, there were three record companies, Philly International, Motown, and Stax, which was owned by Al Bell. And he, um, he had, he he put out the record and it went gold. I was like, that's right up my alley. He knows what to do with it. Called him. He didn't call me back for a week and a half. I kind of forgot. Then he called me. He was like, DC Glenn. And I was like, who is this? He's like, this is Al Bell. I was like, hey, Mr. Bell, how you doing? He's like, dude, what's going on? I was like, I got a record. It's a hit record. I've tested it. I'm in the hottest clubs in the country. Everybody loves it. You need to sign us. And he's like, okay, let's do it. And I was like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. You hadn't even heard the record, dude. Why are you playing with me, right? And I was so passionate. I'll never forget these words that he said to me. He said, brother, I don't have to hear the record. I hear it in your spirit. Yeah. Let's agree to agree. And then I gave my two weeks in Magic City, the club I was at, and signed a messed up record deal. And in a month and a half, we were platinum. Crazy. And it just... You know, to me, it all stems from being a DJ. I, you know, me being a DJ is most my most valuable asset because I can read any crowd. Yeah. I know how to move a crowd. Because back in the days of hip hop, there was only one question. Can you rock a party? Can you move a crowd? Right? That's what I did. And I did it effectively. And that, that works for anything that I do. And, you know, we had... We, we we had a ball. We still have a ball. The rest is history, mm-hmm. you know? And um, I, even to this day, I still get to DJ because if we have an hour show, you know, everybody just wants to hear Woomp, but we have an hour show, I get to DJ for the first half, half hour. Cool. Go back to the 90s and be a kid again, <laughs> right? And that that means a lot to me because you just, if you have the fundamentals, you know how to mix in, you know, your measures and know how, you know, if it's, four measure intro then you wait four measures you know before you bring it in on the outro and you blend it in nicely if you know how to do that you can dj never leaves me right yeah. and it ain't like i have to go find new records and what's playing today because i get to play everything that's in the 90s yeah it works so i've had a good life man i've had a lot of fun i've had adversity and you know i feel very blessed and fortunate to just be able to get up every day and tell people about my journey it's an it's an amazing story and also like one of the biggest things to remember from that period as well is hip hop was um in its infancy infancy in, in mm-hmm. some form of the word. Um in nineteen ninety three you were probably one of the biggest hip hip hop groups at that time. As much as we like to think of guys like NWA at the time they yeah. were they were doing pretty well. But uh, have grown like a cult following since then, I would mm-hmm. say much more. You guys were like yeah. in the charts at the time, like heavily yeah, heavily out there. Like from like um, just doing my research, working with with the, like the, the the Disney Corporation for God's sake. Like working with like Mickey Mouse and doing the Adams yeah. Family films and stuff like that as well, which is awesome. That actually started my voiceover career. Just yeah, you know we're in deep de- deep bowels of Disney, and they, 
you know, we're in, we're in the bowels of Disney, and I am teaching the voices of Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, which is a husband and wife team, how to rap. <laughs> right? And I really don't realize what I'm doing, but they're telling me about animation, and they're teaching me things, and I'm teaching them. And, you know, that started, that really started my voiceover career. It took, you know, 15 years for me to kind of get to it. But I was always doing radio spots. I was always, you know, you know, this Wednesday night. I was I've always been doing that, but that's not what voiceover is, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to learn it the hard way. And I thought it would be easy, but it was the mo one of the most difficult things I ever, you know, learned how to do. And that's, you know, those that's one of my hustles that I've developed over a lifetime full of hustles, right? So that that was important. Another, you know, there are all kind of little things with the Adams family. I'm you know, chilling with the president of, you know, um, Columbia Pictures, yeah, right? And don't know where I'm at. And I could have just been like, hey, man, I want to act. What can I, what I need to do? And he would have told me, but I wasn't thinking back. I was a rock star. I didn't care. <laughs> and, you know, you look at, you, sometimes you beat yourself up over opportunities that you missed. You beat yourself up over mistakes. Mm. And I did that for a while. And then I realized you can still correct those mistakes Definitely. and you can still, you know, you can fulfill those opportunities. Those weren't missed opportunities. Those are delayed opportunities. And it's funny that I used to beat myself up because now I'm a voice of, voice artist and now I'm an actor, right? Yeah. I, I started acting in 2017 and, you know, this year, 2020 is one of the best years of my life, but it was the pandemic, but I shot two movies, three TV shows, tons of voiceover and all the things that I thought I missed out on in life, I'm flourishing in now today. Right. So I can, you know, all I attribute it to is that I bust my butt. I work hard. I think different. I play offense and I don't give up. Mm -hmm. And that's how it happened. So how, um, how do you feel about the term uh, one hit wonder? I don't like I love it. You, there you go. That's, oh, I, I know hey, some people got offended by it, which is why I ask. No, nah, man. So you nah. see, that's, you know, you can get offended by it, but what better hit to have if you got one than one? <laughs> exactly. That's the way I feel about it as well. well but... I don't even look at it that way. And, mm -hmm. if you, you know, if, you, if you're saying it to me in a negative way, yeah. then cool. I will use that to show you why. Well, there it is. It, 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 being a one hit wonder is not a negative thing because I get to do things other people don't. Mm -hmm. I've done more with one song in a career that most people that have 10 albums will never do. Yeah. Right. You know, I am going to live forever. I have a forever hit record. Right. Mm -hmm. There it is, is always going to be a hit record, no matter what. Exactly. To the end of time. And I so even get asked. To celebrate. Yeah. I even got asked, like, well, not in the past year. I haven't DJed in the past year, but um, like at a lot of parties and stuff that I do. It's usually like geared towards like uh, weddings and kind of like mm -hmm. function room thing based stuff rather than mm -hmm. uh, well, that that kind that kind of thing, and I still get asked for that tune to this day. Yeah, quite a lot. Yeah, there's also um, have you heard the, the sort of Euro dance remixes? Like there's like a few remixes of that. I've heard all of them, but see, yeah. all of those serve their purpose because they keep the song alive. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like people like people like don't you get mad about that? I'm like no, see. You can look at the glass half empty or you can look at it half full. Mm -hmm. It's my responsibility. I made the mistake by signing a terrible contract when I was a young man. I take full responsibility for it because I tried to do, I did the best I could, right? But, yeah. you know, nobody can teach you about snakes in the music industry, right? When you're, when you're just a kid and you just want to be a rock star, can nobody, te can nobody tell you anything? Yeah. So I take full responsibility. But what I did realize it's up to me to make my own money off of Wound There It Is because I have a forever hit record. Yeah. And I realized this when I'm sitting in the movie theater and I see Will Ferrell dancing on the table to my song in Elf. Yeah. Right? I know this is going to last forever because it's a Christmas movie. It's a hit Christmas movie and it's going to be playing every year for the until the end of time. Yeah. There's always going to be little things that people are always going to take Wound There It Is because it's now a classic. They're going to remake it. They're going to redo it and everybody's going to remember it again. And it's going to bring back good memories. That's why the, the Geico ice cream commercial works because mm -hmm. it's nostalgia. People love nostalgia. 
That's, that's one of the things that, that's unfortunate. We, we obviously we don't get the Geico commercial in the UK. So that's mm-hmm. one of the kind of... I know that's why you're here to promote it, but I thought it'd be interesting still to get you on for that. But uh, what well, I, I, I could put a little clip in of the Geico commercial for people that haven't seen it. Tasha, did you know Geico could save you hundreds on car insurance and a whole lot more? So what are you waiting for? Hip hop group tag team to help you plan dessert? Ah, uh, French vanilla, rocky road, chocolate peanut butter cookie dough. Scoop this, scoop this, scoop this, scoop this, scoop shaka laka shaka laka shaka laka shaka scoop shaka laka shaka laka shaka laka. Geico, switch today and see all the ways you could save. And then I think a lot of people have seen it because it it, it started as a worldwide uh, YouTube. I mean, um, they started a worldwide Facebook campaign on Christmas. Yeah. So that whole that whole first two days, the twenty sixth and the twenty seventh, whenever you typed in anything on either YouTube or Facebook, we pull up first. Yeah. So you would see it, and I'm sure a lot of people clicked it because it got. Just right now, I think it's at 15 million views, and you know, but I know it's popular because you know you've got two billion impressions. An, impre- an impression is you know what every time somebody plays something over, right? So you can have the views, but when you have that many impressions on that many views, that means you got something that's special and you got something that's a hit, yeah. and that's how you you really can gauge. Um, what if something is really effective and it is you know for me being in a pandemic you know that commercial i usually you get a geico commercial in the states right you're on tour forever salt and pepper did theirs 2014 they didn't stop till the pandemic and what the pandemic did for me it just changed my thinking it made me stop and ask myself what am i going to do and i chose to reinvent myself and I started voiceover in 2009 and everything I do, I record, right? All my classes, everything I record. And I remember voiceover being so difficult for me because I, you know, I thought the teach, you know, the coaches and all that didn't know what they were doing. And it was just me getting in my own way. But when I reinvented myself, I went back to the beginning because I'd had a, I didn't quit. So I was working as, as a voiceover artist throughout, you know, that 10 years but I didn't have mastery over my voice. And I went back and I just started listening to everything and listened to my 10 year ago self talk. And it was just gut wrenching. (laughs) And I listened to my first voiceover and it was just, it was cringeworthy. What what, 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 what sort of things did you hear in your voice back in that time that that you you changed since then? What sort of things were you hearing? Because, you know, back, back in the day, it was, I was a DJ. I was a DJ yeah. and I'm a rapper, so everything is, you know, DC the brain supreme, right? Yeah. It was just everything was just loud, bombacious, mm-hmm. and voiceover is not that. Voiceover is DC the brain supreme. You have to bring it down, mm-hmm. right? And that was difficult. And me being, you know, once again hubris, I'm thinking I can whoop there it is my way through anything. Mm-hmm. And this was one of the things that you couldn't. You had to do the work, and it was difficult. But when I went back and I, I said, I, I know what they're talking about now because I've been in acting class for the last three years. I've been, you've been training for voiceover for the last 10. Mm-hmm. And I redid that first voiceover and it was angelic because I finally had mastery over my voice. And I have 40 of those sessions where I fly to New York and LA and just do my thing and you know, just train hard. And I listened to every last one of them back in March, last year when everybody thought we were all going to turn into zombies and start eating each other (laughs) and you know what i mean i i I just stayed in the dungeon and grinded that out and i started booking Mm -hmm. and then i got opportunity to shoot my first movie then i shoot my second movie then i get two or three voiceovers then i get two tv shows and then here comes geico right and all that all that prepared me for what i'm doing now and sometimes in life you know people look at things as a quid pro quo. If I do this, then this has to happen. And it doesn't work that way, mm-hmm. right? You don't sit there and plant a seed and be like, okay, okay, seed, grow, grow. I need you to grow seed, seed, let's grow. And then if it don't grow, it's like, I quit. Now, we all know people like that, right? Who say, I'm gonna take this class and I'm gonna be this. 
they take the class and then nothing happens and it's like well i'm not doing that you know they think it's just supposed to be instant gratification yeah but see what happens is that i don't i never quit and i play offense it's not it's not that for me i just plant the seeds and keep it moving right and I planted so many seeds in my life that right now, today, I am standing in a forest of opportunity of which I have never, I could have never imagined. You know, the Geico commercial, we couldn't do shows. We couldn't do nothing. I, I could have been happy with just having the commercial on TV. Yeah. But I was like, no, I'm going to take these lemons, make a lemonade company, franchise it, and sell it for $20 million. That's what I'm going to do. That's my mindset. So I tried to find a publicist to just blow it up, right? And no publicists really wanted to work with me because we're in COVID. They're thinking that we did, everything is different than what we used to do. And just, I was like, okay, thank you. Mm. But here's a, here's a good hustle move for all you people out there. If there's something you ever wanna do, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. If you get stuck on something, there's a way, right? Don't ever quit. Don't ever think that, well, if they say I can't do it, I can't do it. Because every time that happens to me, I, I join an organization, society, or, you know, um, association. And those entities are filled with people who are in a certain profession. And they've been doing this for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Yep. And they've mastered it. And their whole goal now is just to make their profession grow stay on top of all the innovative ideas to make their profession better and nurture the people who are coming into their profession so they don't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is join an organization. So I joined the Public Relations Society of America. I wanna be my own publicist. And I get on a Zoom call a couple of days later, a couple of days after I joined and I'm on this Zoom call with a CEO of this PR firm. And I raised my hand, like, a press release is still relevant because I'm, you know, figuring out to, when to drop this press release. And they're like, well, what's it for? And I'm like, well, I'm kind of featured in this national Geico commercial called Scoop, There It Is. And I'm looking at the chat and everybody's like, wait a minute, is that, that can't be him. Oh my <laughs> God, it's him. I love that commercial. My kids love that commercial. That's the greatest commercial ever. Chat blows up, the moderator's eyes are getting big. And they're like, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, y'all. We'd like to welcome DC Glenn. He's brand new to the organization. And we're going to talk about that Geico commercial afterward. But back to his question, a press release is relevant. And the CEO is like, yes, because the whole last year, every story has been about COVID. Yep. Every story has been political. Every story has been gloom and doom. Every story has been about lockdown. And here you guys come throwing sprinkles and bringing joy and, you know, happiness to everybody, to the world when they need it. And DC, your smile just is so infectious. And it's what the world needed. And she's like, yes, this, your press release is going to be relevant because, because of that. And not only because of that, because you're going to go here for the journalists. You're going to go here for the TV shows. You're going to go here for the podcast. You're going to go here for this. You're going to make sure your pitches are like this. And because I joined the organization, because I didn't give up, because I play offense, and because I don't give a damn what nobody tells me, she gave me the whole game in 10 minutes and I haven't looked back and it has opened doors for me. I could have never imagined in my life. It has made my life whole it has made me better. And it is the reason you and I are talking right now. Yeah. Go figure. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. now it's wide open. Now uh, there's three or four things I want to talk to you about that. I can't because I'm under a non-disclosure agreement. Right. Yeah. That's how big it has been for me. My future is bright and I'm 50 something and I feel like I'm 22 all over again. Do you have, uh, obviously you said you've done a bunch of uh, voiceover work already. Do you have stuff that's out right now or like, is it all just like MP pre-production and stuff? No, stuff that, I've got a lot of stuff out, but it's all like regional, uh, okay. you know, stuff here, stuff there. It's an ongoing thing. You can make money off of it, but to have a career on it, it's kind of, you know, you have to, it takes time, but I do a lot of things, all the things that I told you as a DJ, you know, people like you're doing, you know, people would criticize me and say, you're not, you, you're a photographer, but you don't make no money doing it. I'm like, it's not for that. Right. It's like, you know, everybody's like, well, you got tentacles all over the place. You should just do one thing. And I'm like, no, I shouldn't. Because if you live long enough 
and you hustle hard enough, all those tentacles become one yeah. and they serve you, right? And people always say, jack of all trades, master of none. But all those hustles together serve you. And the very thing that they're saying that you can't do, you've done. And now some of those trades, you've become masterful and they serve you mm -hmm. in a way that they'll never know because they thought you could, they thought you were just on the wrong path. So I tell people, you know, go hard. It's nothing but work, right? Go hard, think different. Like I think differently people, and it's taken me a while to do this, but I do it. People say, hey, you know, people come complain to me all the time, give me excuses, give me problems. And in my mind, I'm not really listening to them. I'm solving their problem in my mind. Because if you give me an excuse, I'm going to give you a, a solution to that excuse where you can't use that excuse anymore. It it's going to require work, but I've given you, I've, I've given, I've made five solutions for that excuse. Now I put that in my, you know, I don't have a tool belt, you know, because these are tools to me. I don't have a tool shed. I mean, I don't have a tool, uh, tool box. I got a tool shed, right? You're going to walk in my tool shed and you're going to see things like, what is that for? Well, that's if I get in this situation, that's the solution. Well, that's, if this happens, that's the solution. So I love doing, I love talking to people because I get to take their problems and their excuses and turn them into solutions that serve me. It's a different way of thinking. I think of solutions first. If I, if I run up against a problem, let me think of the most fantastical, pie in the sky, just elaborate, just far-fetched solution, <laughs> right? And then inch your way back to practicality. Well, what's practical? Because what's that? That far-fetched thing is real. Yep. Me making whoop, there it is, and being a rock star was far-fetched. But you work your way back. See, most people work their way from the bottom up. You 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 visioned what you what you want, then you work your way back to the point where okay, I can do that. Now let's go to the next thing. You basically made a business plan for yourself, thinking differently, coming backward to practicality. Now you're moot. Now you're growing. You're getting better every day. And now you've reached your goal. I've done it several times in different ways in my life. And that is the most effective way to live your life. Because when you don't, when you think about solutions instead of problems or excuses, that kills your ego. That kills your pride. Now your pride and your ego is sequestered inside of you. And it's not a factor, right? Because you've learned how to think another way. So you, you might react viscerally, you might disagree with someone, but you're not going to go down the rabbit hole of fantasy because being wrong is an incredible thing. You know, being wrong is the path to being right. We all know these people who you argue with and they love to win arguments and they will argue you down and argue and they'll keep going. I let them go down the rabbit hole because... I'm not going to do that because it doesn't make any sense. And I'll let them win. I'll let them go in a rabbit hole because now that impracticality and that unreality becomes their reality, not mine. And now they'll be stuck forever because that's the way they think. That's how, yeah. that's why I have to be, that's, I mean, that's what the, 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 the pandemic exposed. Did you ever realize it was this many ignorant people in the world? Never. <laughs> 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 it was it's been eye opening like so many things have like so many crazy people have come out of the woodwork yes we have always been there it's always been there uh, it's just exposed to no a sort shame. of maximum level and now they're, crazy. They're, 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 you know there was shame but now there's no shame yeah but see the thing is that those people are always going to be stuck because they're in unreality yeah and they get mad they get angry and then they just become old and bitter and then who wants to live a life like that? Exactly, man. Exactly. So I'm different, man. I'm different. I know, you know, that's why I said just push, the, just push record. Let's go. <laughs> hey, push, push the button. I got, I got a lot of stuff for you, man. But I, I, I want to thank you for letting me come on your, you know, on, on your show and just run my mouth because 
it means more to me to talk about my life yeah. because I know I have really good solutions for people. And these are the things that I wish someone had told me when I was a young man, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I'm better for it. So I appreciate you. Um, I kind of got to get out of here. I got to audition. No problem, man. <laughs> no problem at all. But if you got another question, go ahead. And shoot no, that's right. I was just, I was just going to agree with most, with pretty much everything you said. Like the, the your hustle mentality has been, just, like for me, just just to hear that is it, great for me. That's that's brilliant. So yeah. the, a lot of the things you were saying, I totally agree. And it's everything we run for it. I yeah. don't know what the logo is, but we have the logo up here, B10 Media. Um, so yeah, thank you, DC. Much much appreciated, man. Yeah, you got it. And you know. We ever get over there? Hopefully, we can meet because everybody can tell you, you need to go to Scotland. You need to go to Scotland. You, you, you know, you'll love it, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. But hey, awesome! You have a great day, and thank you for having me on your show. Oh, well, do man. Thank you very much. All right, All right. Later. Bye, man.